Welcome to uh, today's University of Oxford uh, COVID Conversations. I'm Richard Cornell. I'm the Nuffield Professor of Clinical Medicine. Uh, last week we had an overview of our activities from Gavin Screety, and this week we're going to drill down into how we're looking at the pathology of the virus with Professor William Jones from the, the Dunn School of Pathology. Um, in, in, uh, and uh, just to, to uh, draw your attention to the fact that you can send questions uh, through the chat window on YouTube or on Twitter, or you can email COVID conversations at admin.ox.ac.uk as we proceed. So in many ways, the university was fairly well prepared for the call to arms in January um, because of our global network and our overseas units. And uh, we were involved in the first trials in Wuhan and we'd already been developing a, a vaccine to, to MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. Um, and we were also able to share genetic codes with our friends in China uh, and make proteins. But what we really, we couldn't do was, um, we didn't have the capacity to grow the virus itself. And, and we needed that for a number of reasons. And to, for that piece of the jigsaw, we turned to the Dunn School of Pathology, which is where Williams uh, lab is placed there very close to, to where a penicillin was developed 80 years ago. Um, and the question that we've asked William to address here today is what his lab is doing and how it's supporting wider projects across the university and, and why it's important for us to understand the pathology of the disease in, in, in more detail and what the benefits of that are. So with that introduction, I'm gonna hand over to William and, and ask him to, to tell us about his work. Thank you very much, Richard, a uh, very kind introduction. So as Richard says, I'm going to try and illustrate some of the things we're doing in the SARS-CoV-2 core facility in South Parks Road, um, particularly focusing on the work on uh, analyzing the virus and its pathogenesis. So this facility has been in operation for quite a large number of years, 25 years, as an HIV research facility. And we took the decision uh, back before Easter that we needed to have uh, a SARS-CoV-2 facility to be able to support the wider uh, coronavirus research going on in Oxford. So what you see there is a picture of, uh, of me and, and Becky Moore, who is the uh, person who runs the, the facility and has done the lion's share of the, the work in getting it ready. Uh, on the day that we received the uh, information from the HSC that we were certified to start work on the virus, you can see that there's quite a lot of relief all around there. So since uh, launching the facility around Easter, uh, we've had uh, project proposals from over 30 collaborators around Oxford and the wider area in a whole range of topics uh, from antiviral drug development through immunity, pathogenesis, genetics and molecular biology. Um, and I will just talk about a few examples, of those first three in, in the slides as we go on. What our facility is able to do uh, is with the help of a further eight research assistants that Becky and I have been training over the last few uh, weeks, we're able to do a, a range of standardized tests and procedures and to support bespoke research projects. Those standard tests and procedures include the ability to culture virus from clinical samples or reference strains, to test the eff efficacy of antiviral drugs, to test how potent antibodies are at neutralizing the virus, to measure the viral RNA by RT-PCR and banking and sequencing and quality controlling all the viruses that, that we receive and work on. So um, the first project that uh, really came to hit us was uh, one that we weren't expecting at all. Uh, uh, some clinical uh, colleagues uh, illustrated there on the left um, had a, a real challenge. They had a very large number of samples coming from patients, very often bloods as illustrated here, a small number of which uh, had detectable coronavirus RNA in them. And because they had that, they were forced to handle them in the same containment level three type facilities that I've just shown you on the previous slide, which is much more laborious and slower uh, than the normal diagnostic lab, which really slowed things up and made the whole pipeline of diagnosis and clinical research very, very difficult. So they asked us to find out whether these samples were actually safe, even though they had a small amount of RNA in them. So just to illustrate the sort of uh, assays we were able to do, we were able to repeat their observations. This is the famous RT-PCR assay that Tom Benneker uh, ran in our lab. It's a time axis along the bottom here and the signal up on the y-axis. 
And you can see that as time goes on, you get signals coming up from RNA standards, that is known amounts of viral RNA, which come up progressively later and later, the smaller the amounts of viral RNA uh, there are in your sample. What we found was, as indeed our clinical friends were expecting, uh, that there were some of the samples they sent us had no detectable RNA in them at all. In fact, that represents the majority of samples they're normally handling. But a proportion of the samples had these low levels of RNA coming up here around about 100, in the range of 100 uh, to 10 copies of viral RNA per sample. And that's the question, are those dangerous or are those safe? So to answer that, we took those samples and we cultured them in uh, individual little wells of a type of cell that can grow the virus. And in parallel, we challenged similar wells with virus of known concentration down to one or no infectious units. And after culturing those for three or four days, we then reanalyzed those cultures because if any real virus had been present, it should have amplified enormously and we should be able to detect a very strong RNA signal. So the answer is shown here at the bottom that the cultured bloods that started off being negative were still negative. They're still just the same as water. And I do apologize for the change in color here. It's just a feature of the software. Whereas those uh, cultures in which we'd added defined amounts of virus, even the very vanishingly small amounts of virus, we were able to recover very high signals. But all of those bloods that had these low levels of RNA to start with were still low. So there'd been absolutely no virus growth whatsoever in culture. So this enabled us to tell our colleagues that yes, these samples were perfectly safe and that what we were picking up at those low levels was debris, not real virus. And the way I'm beginning to think about uh, this debris is it's analogous to the flotsam that fetches up on a distant shore when a ship goes down at sea. That flotsam may be quite toxic and unpleasant, but it isn't seaworthy. And one of the research focuses going forward will be to try and understand what that flotsam is doing, whether it's causing a problem or whether we can safely ignore it. So that's one little example of the sort of work uh, we, we've been able to do. The most of the uh, requests for uh, access to our facility have come in the field of antiviral research. This is a very important area, of course, because there are no as yet fully validated drugs that work against this virus. And uh, there are a number of uh, problems with the ones that are being assessed at the moment. So Nicole Zitzman is leading a, a team to uh, evaluate a very large number of novel candidate antiviral molecules against uh, this virus using, uh, using the core facility to answer the question on a very open basis, very comparable basis, which are the strongest candidates to enter into further trials, both in, in, in clinical trials going on. Now, Nicole is going to be giving a much more detailed presentation on her work in this area in the next COVID conversation next week. So I recommend that you join them to hear much more about the story. Another big area of interest from a number of our colleagues is on the uh, ability of antibodies and related molecules to neutralize virus. Now, this is a little bit different from a drug. An antibody is a much, much bigger molecule, at least 100 times bigger. And what it does is it binds to virus and prevents it from getting into cells in the first place, rather than inhibiting the virus once it's got into the cells. So uh, what we're illustrating here is the viral spike protein in three colors, because it's a trimer, and there are many copies of that on each individual virus, complex with, in this case, two nanobodies, a yellow one and a salmon colored one here, which bind to the important part of the virus spike that is known to be necessary for the virus to attach and enter cells. And the question is whether those nanobodies or whether other molecules that have similar sorts of activity, these bispecific molecules or these nucleic acid aptimus or other types of antibody, whether any of them have really strong potency at preventing the infection of virus into cells in culture. And again, we're going to do this in an entirely open way so that all molecules, wherever they've come from around the world, are put through the same pipeline of tests and the data are produced in the same way. So the proper co uh, uh, comparisons can be made between uh, agents to identify which are the most useful. And then finally, uh, there's a, a, quite a large number of very, very different projects coming from our science colleagues, including ourselves, 
around Oxford and further afield, asking particular questions about the biology of the virus. This could be anything from the genetics of susceptibility to the immunology of the response to the structures of the, uh, of the virion or of components of the replication complex itself. Uh, each of those are very different and we're in the business of trying to support those projects. Um, these projects will be coming on stream as those really urgent ones on antivirals and antibody tests uh, gradually pass through our system. Uh, I'd like to just illustrate one of them uh, for you today, which is one that I and some colleagues uh, here are particularly interested in, which is can antibodies that we generate during the immune response actually cause a problem? So to try and explain uh, what I mean, uh, I'm sure you know that this virus SARS-CoV-2 replicates for the most part up in the upper airways and in, in the nasopharynx of, of, of people. And quite often it passes from person to person before ever causing uh, significant pathology or disease uh, in, in the host. But in a small fraction of cases, it passes into the lungs. And in, amongst those, you can get some uh, pneumonias and other serious complications, which can in, uh, in, in some sad cases be themselves fatal. What happens in those really serious cases is that in the air sacs of the lung, which are illustrated here, which are surrounded by these type 1 cells shown in salmon, which is where the gas exchange happens between the air and the blood found in these blood vessels shown here in, in red. What happens is that there's a, a, um, a, a release of fluid from the blood vessels. They become leaky and those walls of the air sacs become thickened and the air sacs themselves shrink up so that the amount of air oxygen being exchanged with the blood goes down and down and down, resulting in, in those problems that I'm sure you've, you've all read about. What we don't understand is exactly what causes all that. We do know that the cell in the uh, air sacs that's most susceptible to infection is this green cell here, the type 2 pneumocyte. That cell is, is uh, the most common cell, in fact, in, in that organ, and it gives rise to the type 1 cells when it's needed. The second type of cell, uh, the second most common type of cell in the air sacs is the alveolar macrophage illustrated here. And what that is doing is constantly surveying its environment to check that the type 1 cells are okay, clearing them up when they're damaged, and instructing the type 2 cells to make more type 1 cells. They're, they're also there to try and guard against any incoming pathogens or, and clear away uh, detritus as it appears. So those are very interesting cells to us, because what might be happening is that when we make an immune response to the virus, which in part is characterized by the generation of antibodies to the virus particle capable of binding to the virus particle, what we're hoping is going to happen is that antibody having bound to the virus will prevent it or neutralize it from infecting the type two cell, as I've illustrated in the earlier slide. But we know from other well-attested viruses and indeed have uh, early evidence that this might be happening also in this virus, the antibody bound to virus can make the virus now able to in enter, possibly infect, and possibly uh, elicit an inflammatory reaction in macrophages. And indeed, we see in post-mortem samples and in animal models, we see a lot of viral antigen in these macrophages. And remember, these macrophages do not have the receptor for the virus on its own, so it must be getting in some other way. Now, if antibody of the wrong type is enhancing infection or entry of the virus particle into the macrophages, might that itself be enough to in initiate the inflammatory response that eventually results in the cytokine storm that uh, has been talked about a lot, which generates the pneumonia, which is so fatal. So we're hoping with, with colleagues in Oxford and elsewhere to use the technologies we've got available to us to examine this question in, in a great deal of detail. And with any luck, by understanding what is possible in a model system, we'll be able to suggest new and more targeted ways of treating virus infection so that those really serious uh, disease uh, cases can be treated effectively, uh, much more so than at the moment. So that's all I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, donors to this program for having made such uh, significant contributions without which we couldn't have brought the Containment Level 3 lab back into operation for uh, coronavirus work. Um, if you have found this interesting, you want to get more involved in the work of the COVID-19 research community in Oxford, please follow the links that you will see uh, below. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, William. 
So I'm, I'm going to, um, I've got a number of questions to, that, that people have, have, have been asking. And, and so I'd like to start off, if I may, by asking a little bit about, um, about you know, why some people, you think some people do so have asymptomatic infections and why some people seem to do so badly. And, and yeah. to what extent is that the, the virus being different between individuals or is it individual susceptibility? What, 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 what do we know about that? My suspicion is it's mostly the latter, that is, it's down to the individuals. There's a, there's, a, there's a famous phrase about influenza, which was this was a virus that was incredibly variable in its biology, but gave rise to very much the same pathology whenever it hit. This coronavirus is very, very conservative in its biology. This particular coronavirus uh, around the world, although there's a certain amount of genetic variation, it's really very, very tight. But the pathology that's generated varies enormously from person to person. As we were saying earlier, many, many people have passed it on to another person before they ever knew they were infected. And that's probably the majority of people have mild or, or, or inapparent symptoms. And it's really this transition from a, a, a virus which replicates in the upper respiratory tract to one that goes into the lungs, which I think is the, is, is the critical determining feature. It's interestingly one really big difference between this virus and the original SARS virus, of course. The original SARS virus was, not, although it bound to the same receptors, which are abundant in the, in the upper airways, it didn't give rise to the same uh, upper airway infection, which transmits easily in the asymptomatic stage. It only uh, gave uh, transmission once it had got down into the lungs. And we're beginning to get some clues as to why those two viruses are different, but where we're really wanting to understand is why are people different? Now we know some of the variables that, are, uh, uh, that, that seem to be driving this from our epi epidemiology colleagues. So we know that you and I, Richard, being gentlemen of a certain age, are more at risk of developing severe disease than younger people and women. Uh, we know that people from certain uh, groups uh, that might have different genetic structures have different susceptibilities one from the other, but we haven't yet pinned down what those genetic components might be. We also know that um, body weight is probably one of the biggest uh, driving factors, so obese uh, individuals are at a higher risk than slim individuals. Um, so that we know these variables are there, we know some of them map on or correlate with our antibody responses to antigens and vaccines. Uh, we know that uh, some of them map on to the levels of ACE2 receptor on certain types of cells, but we don't have the, a complete answer to that question yet. And I think it's a really, really important set of questions. So is, is that because of the epidemiology, and we've obviously been, we've been, we've been going at this in Oxford for four months and, yeah. and the disease is just a little bit longer. And, and that's primarily because the epidemiology has not been, been going long enough really to collect sufficient data. That's probably Absolutely. the case. It's all well. about quantity of data and, 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 and being really critical about making sure the data is collected and classified in the same way so it's properly comparable. It, it's, a, it's a very hard business. It's what some of our colleagues in the Big Data Institute in Oxford do very, very well. And, and some of the some of the susceptibilities will be things like like drugs that people are taking or absolutely uh, habits that, that people adopt that they'll also be strong. Totally right. And and of course, uh, with almost all diseases, particularly infectious diseases, there's a strong correlation with uh, wealth and de deprivation. So people who who live in significantly deprived circumstances are at higher risk from this as as with other diseases. Yeah. Why, why do you think that the disease, I mean, that the pattern of the disease seems to be, you know, there's a period during which people are relative, are affected, they've got a fever, typically, yeah. they've got a cough, but, but, the, but it's, the, it's, it's not severe, and then, then it gets worse, if it gets worse, and, and exactly. what is that speculating? I think, I think that's a really, really fascinating question, we're all scratching our heads about that. Yes, you're right, you can be, you can be, holding this unpleasant, really quite high fever, feeling really bad for a week, and then you get better and come out of it, or it can flip into something much, much more severe. Why is that? Um, we, I, we don't know the answer to that, but possibly, one, one of the possibilities I was raising in that talk is it might be to do with the quality of the immune response you're right. getting at various stages. We know that with other viruses, um, you have a huge range of outcomes depending on the pace and quality of the immune response to it. So in other words, if you have a really fast and effective response 
to the virus right at the beginning, you often get no symptoms at all. If you have an incredibly sluggish uh, response to the virus, you could also maybe with some viruses get no symptoms. It's in that unpleasant middle spot where the virus gets a hold and then you come in once there's a lot of virus with a strong immune response that you get the really damaging symptoms. There's a little analogy uh, 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 in terms of how you handle the epi epidemics in, uh, in, in the, the public sphere, I suppose, you know, where, where countries have chosen to clamp down really, really early on, on, on the infection, you have a relatively small number of people affected. It's very sad for those people are affected, but it doesn't spread wider. It's possible that in countries where they let it run through, it's very unpleasant for quite a lot of people, but the economy doesn't crash. If you get it just at the wrong point, maybe you get a very severe impact. Um, and uh, the pathology of the virus in the body can be reflecting that a bit. So there are, so there are a couple of ways in which we might be able to, to, tr to, to treat infection that is already established in an individual. One is by uh, direct drugs against the virus. Yeah. And that's really why we need to have this facility. We built this facility in Oxford. And pr prior to you starting this, we were dependent on Port and Dow, which is also useful because um, Miles Carroll, who is a director of research at Port and Dow, he also is part of the, the university here. But now we have this facility, we need that to screen drugs, which will potentially uh, either antibodies, as you've described, or, or uh, drugs which might be enzyme inhibitors against Absolutely. for example, which the, the virus depends on. So that's a possibility. But the other possibility, of course, is to try to ameliorate the, the, the effects exactly. of the disease, which you've talked about. And a number of people are, are writing in and asking, um, you know, what are the treatments that might be able to modify the inflammatory response, for really example. And I mean, it's very yeah. early days and we need to find out more about that, but there are some things that, that we Absolutely. might- Absolutely. Uh, uh, as you know, it's very, very early days, but uh, as, as you mentioned, there's this big inflammatory response, which is almost certainly at the heart of the, the lung pathology and perhaps other bits of pathology as well. And there are some components of that which are particularly elevated in serious disease. And there are some uh, uh, agents, drugs, antibodies under evaluation, which are able selectively to target those components. And we will find out over the next few months whether those are able to dampen down the pathological response to the, the virus infection without uh, letting the virus itself cause direct damage. And that's the, that's the, that's the real uh, balancing act that, 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 that needs to be done. Yeah, it's that balancing act to, you know, the, the archetypical thing would be steroids, dampens the immune response, but, but also... Right. Not. Exactly, exactly right. And, and IL-6, anti-IL-6, these are all other treatments that, that, yeah, might, exactly that, right. that might be tried. Um, one of the challenges at the moment, of course, is, is getting sufficient numbers for these trials, isn't it? And, and so you, have, you, you can't do that many trials because the number of people that are affected need to be sufficient to have a meaningful result. Um, and, and that's obviously an, another big challenge that we're facing. Yeah, and I, I suppose the one about. contribution we can make to that, Richard, is uh, we, we obviously can't do much about the clinical trials or the scale of the, of the patient population. But what we can help people do is make really objective choices based on good evidence of which are the truly most effective in vitro against the virus to, to make those higher priorities than others. Yeah, right. And, and another thing we're doing is trying to sort is to really drill down into the immunology by taking cells from patients yes. and, and trying to, to look at those in a lot of detail, aren't we? So that's another way in which we're trying to work with that. Somebody, some people have been asking me about the spectrum of disease and, you know, a bit more about the ACE2 receptor of the spike protein, which enables the virus to get into the cells. Yeah. And some people asking, well, one question, interesting question um, is about um, the GI tract, you know, why the, the, the gut's affected. And um, I've had a, lot, a number of patients myself who've had, you know, GI symptoms, sometimes just isolated GI symptoms. There's not yeah. much else, but they've been positive. Yes. Uh, yeah, so why do you think there might be differences between individuals there? Is it the same phenomenon or right. is there anything specific that might, might be going on? 
Well, um, I think this is really difficult to answer because wherever you've got what you might call almost an idiopathic response, that is, you know, each patient is responding in a different sort of way, it's very hard to do a sufficiently well-powered study to be able to get some trends out that can tell us what's going on. So that's a technical problem with clinical research in these sorts of these sorts of areas. I'm sure I'm sure you face all the time, Richard. Um, as a as a scientist, I tend to favour the simplest explanation uh, that covers the most of the available data wherever possible. And at the moment, although we definitely have all sorts of symptoms outside the uh, lungs. We have symptoms in the gut, we have symptoms in the heart, we have symptoms elsewhere. And we can find that flotsam RNA in some of those tissues. We haven't yet been able to culture any real replication competent virus from any tissue outside the, the nasopharynx and, uh, and the lung. And it could be and this is a bit like flu or most flu infections. It could be that those, uh, uh, those symptoms that are happening elsewhere are the result of the flotsam rather than result of the replication of the virus locally. Um, now, that's highly speculative. It's something we're going to try and investigate. Might some of that uh, junk RNA from the virus, the flotsam as I've called it, might it, it itself stimulate an inappropriate inflammatory response in tissues like the gut or the heart. We don't know. Um, I think it's a simpler explanation than some. It's possible that we'll find there's a stratify a subset of patients where you can detect some replication in other tissues, in which case we'll have a much more direct explanation. But at the moment, we don't see that. One, one of the things where you know that you're taking part in and we're trying to set up within the university is, a, is capacity for doing uh, ELISA, so we can take that. That's a test that allows us to measure the antibody levels uh, in people, and and see if we can contribute that to the national effort. Yeah. Uh, and and so this result that you've got that um, that we can't that we can detect viral RNA in the blood, but but the blood is essentially there's no infectious particles. It's a very important result for us because it, it, it facilitates doing those tests yeah. uh, in a much more simple and straightforward way. Um, and of course, that could have implications for all sorts of laboratories across the whole country. The NHS, that will make Absolutely. a very big difference to them. Um, but how safe, how sure can we be that having tested it in a few samples that you've done, that, that that's a generalizable principle? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, that, that's a question. I, I yeah, that's, uh, and, and it's almost, uh, the, we can be as certain as the scale at which we do the testing, I suppose. It's all about probabilities, yeah? Mm. We, that first bit where we've analyzed uh, a few dozen samples tells us that it's not common that that RNA is infectious and it's below a very low level of probability that an RNA is going to be infectious, but it's not zero. And if you're handling millions of samples of virus, you don't know how much below the, 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 the sample number you're handling it is. It could be so far below that nobody ever gets exposed to virus or it could be somewhere else. So probably, other labs need to do the same sorts of experiments on a larger scale uh, to, uh, to, to try and, uh, and, and replicate our findings. That's, there's a lot to be said for labs around the world doing, uh, reproducing our findings or each other's findings so that we can be confident that it isn't just an artifact of a particular local environment. Right, but, but like many of these things, it, it basically comes down to a prob probability. Probabilities, exactly. Um, so I've got a few other questions from, from um, from uh, uh, people here. Um, one, one question is, um, if we've got a, a vaccine uh, developed against, um, against, against um, MERS, does that, does that help in making the current vaccine? And I think the answer is it did, because it, it basically we, we just swapped out the protein for the, uh, the spike from the MERS to the to the new version, and, and that's what gave us confidence that we probably will be able to make an immunogenic vaccine. Is that that's right, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, 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 I think the the work that our colleagues have been doing on the MERS thing really put us in a real pole position to be able to rapidly test a rational vaccine and know that it could be ramped up in in scale if it proved to be positive. Of course, what it doesn't tell you is whether the immunity will be sufficient in this particular case, but it it. it gets you a long, long way there. Okay. One question, does vitamin D affect the quality of the immune response? 
or effect. I think the, the question really is in respect of, 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 of SARS. And well, uh, we were discussing that earlier today. We were discussing we? that earlier, weren't we? There's, there's always been lots and lots and lots of discussions about vitamin D. Vitamin D is the new vitamin C, I think, in terms of wonder cure, isn't it? Um, I think we were told, correct me if I'm wrong, we can't yet see a significant difference between the outcomes of those that are taking supplements of vitamin D and those that are not. Um, that doesn't control for normal dietary vitamin D or sun exposure or the rest of it but it's, it's making it look like it isn't the miracle cure. Uh, would you agree with that evaluation, Richard? Well, at, at the moment, uh, there's no clear correlation with vitamin D supplementation at any rate and, and, and protection. And um, I, um, I think the same is true for, for other vitamin supplements. People, yeah. people are asking about that. Um, well, that's a really interesting set of questions, Richard. I'm sure we could carry on chatting about them for a, a, a great deal of time, but um, you're a very busy man um, and you've got to, to, to run this very important Oxford Coronavirus 19 research network. So I think we should let you get back to doing that. I think so, William. So thank you very much and, and, uh, and uh, thank everybody for, for watching. Um, as you said earlier, I'd like to remind everybody that there'll be another talk from Nicole Zitzman next week about the drug discovery and more details about giving donation for our research are, uh, are linked uh, to the, the presentation. And, uh, and thank you very much. We'll continue our discussion, I guess. Goodbye.